Okay, well, welcome everyone to this event in uh, IRCPL's series on uh, religion and climate, uh, the title of which is um, Faith in Thoreau. My name is Matthew Engelke. I'm the director of IRCPL, and it's um, really nice to have you all here and to have our panelists uh, convened at last. This was supposed to take place uh, last fall and was postponed because of the graduate student worker strike. Uh, we're very glad that that has been successfully resolved, and we're very happy to be here now uh, in the spring. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words uh, before we get started, and, and I turn over to my colleague, uh, Branka Arsic, who will be um, chairing this evening's event. Um, this is a, a webinar format, as many of you will be uh, familiar with. Uh, at any point during the, uh, the presentations or the conversation, um, you are welcome to pose questions. And you can do so by looking down at the bottom of your Zoom screen in the, in the right-hand corner, there should be a Q&A box. So please feel free to post your questions there for the panelists at, at, any, at any point. Um, you don't have to wait until it's the Q&A session. Um, uh, we have three speakers this evening. Uh, they're each gonna speak for, I think about 15 minutes each, 10 minutes each. Um, I can't remember what we said, but um, probably around that amount of time. And then uh, Branka will engage them in some discussion for about 20 minutes. And then uh, up until seven o'clock, there will be time for questions from, from you, the audience. Um, so uh, this event kind of came about through thinking about the ways in which uh, here at IRCPL, we could explore themes of uh, the connections between religion and climate and climate change, uh, environmentalism, and uh, a focus on Thoreau seemed an obvious, um, an, an, uh, one obvious point um, of, of departure. Um, and it, it occurred to me uh, that, that reaching out to, to my colleague, uh, Branka Arsic in, in the English department um, would be a good move given her, her uh, incredible work on, on Thoreau and on the period in which Thoreau was, was working. So I'm very grateful to her uh, for the conversations that we have had in, in putting this event together and bringing together uh, three incredible scholars who have um, contributed to our understandings of, of, um, of Thoreau, of, uh, of the connections between uh, religion and, and environmentalism and philosophy and a range of other topics uh, in and beyond the 19th century. Um, and uh, yeah, this was, this was a, lot of, a lot of fun to put together. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, say a few more things. Uh, first, let me thank the staff of IRCPL, as always, for their incredible work in, in helping um, make this all possible. And uh, very big thanks to, to, to Branka for, uh, for chairing tonight. Um, Branka Arsic, is, as many of you may know, is the Charles and Lin Zhang Professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Columbia. Um, she's the author of numerous books, um, most of which focus on um, 19th, uh, 19th century literatures, but also um, science and, and philosophy and uh, the context of uh, religion and religious faith. Um, the book that I was um, uh, kind of thinking about most um, and being very much an outsider in this area, but was absolutely mesmerized by is her 2016 book, Bird Relics, Grief and Vitalism in Thoreau. And I have to say, I mean, in, in the past five years, it's, it's by far one of the most incredible and innovative and imaginative books I've, I've read. So um, I'm, you know, Really looking forward to the ways in which um, Branka shepherds us through this um, discussion. So um, I will now turn over to, to her. And uh, again, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for um, inviting me and uh, allowing me to chair uh, the session with these distinguished speakers. Uh, I will 
very briefly introduce uh, uh, our speakers so that we have uh, more time for uh, discussion. Um, I plan to introduce them in alphabetical order, but then I realized that that is the order in which they will speak. Um, so I'll start by introducing Alda Baltrop Lewis, uh, who is a research fellow in the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at Australian Catholic University and a scholar of religion and politics. Before coming to Australia, she completed a PhD in religion at Princeton University. She has also thought, uh, she, can, she has also taught in the religious studies department at Brown University. And she has worked as a research assistant for the Peabody Award winning public radio program on B produced in the United States. Her research focus, focuses on religion, environmental ethics, and the circulation of ideas among theological, artistic, and popular idioms. Her first book, Thoreau's Religion, Walden Woods, Social Justice, and the Politics of Asceticism, published at Cambridge University Press in 2021, treats Thoreau's, uh, Thoreau as an inheritor of traditional ascetic practices and argues that his asceticism is politically relevant, both in his, in his own period and for contemporary environmental ethics. She is currently at work on a book about Thomas Merton's engagement with the politics of the, of the 1960s. She serves as a series editor for the American Academy of Religion book series, Reflection and Theory in the Study of Religion, published by Oxford University Press, and on the executive committee of the Association for the Study of Literature, Environment and Culture, Australia, New Zealand. Jane Bennett is Andrew Mellon Professor of the Humanities at Johns Hopkins University. She is one of the founders of the journal Theory and Events and edited the journal Political Theory from 2012 to 2017. Uh, Professor Bennett specializes in political theory, ecological philosophy, art and politics, American political thought, political rhetoric and persuasion, and contemporary social theory. She has been a fellow at the International uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Bauhaus University, Weimar, Germ Germany, at Oxford University, at Verbit uh, Institute for Humanities, and the Humanities Research, Research Center uh, at Australian National University. Uh, she is uh, uh, the author of uh, various books, uh, most recently, Influx and Efflux, Writing Up with Walt Whitman, um, that came out with Duke University Press in 2020. Um, then Vibrant Matter, a, a Political Ecology of Things, also with Duke University Press in 2010. Then The Enchantment of Modern Life, Attachments, Crossings, and Ethics, um, published at Princeton University Press in 2001. Thoreau's Nature, Ethics, Politics, and the Wild, um, and uh, that came out in 1994. And, um, her maybe first book, Unthinking Faith and Enlightenment, Nature and the State in the post hegelian Era, uh, published with New York University Press in 1987. And John Modern is a professor of religious studies at Franklin and Marshall College. He is the author of uh, The Pop Apocalypse, uh, The Religious Visions of Kerouac, Ginsburg, and Barrows, published with University of Illinois Press in 2001, and Secularism in Antebellum America, published by Chicago, University of Chicago Press in 2011. His work has appeared in journals such as History of the Present, Great Gray Room, American Literary History, Social Text, Journal of the American Academy of Religion, Religion in American Culture, American Religion, Church History, um, as well as in a range of online venues. More recently, or most recently, uh, he published uh, a book called Neuromatic or a particular history of a religion and the brain, um, which was published by the University of Chicago Press. In that book, um, religious, uh, uh, religious studies, modern offers an examination of 
the history of the cognitive revolution and current attempts to locate all that is human in the brain, including spirituality itself. Neuromatic is a widely original take on the entangled histories of science and religion that lie behind our brain laden present. From 18th century revivals to the origin of neurology and mystic visions of mental piety in the 19th century. So Modern is currently working on a long-term project that explores the end of the world through the lens of Akron, Ohio. So please uh, join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you all for being with us. Um, and I guess we can start. Um, Alda, I think you're um, first. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, your work has been so important to me, so I'm really honored to get to be here with you and um, the rest of this very distinguished panel. As is customary in Australia, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, their connection to this country where I live and work has nurtured it through thousands of generations. Um, so this talk will eventually be about chickadees. The Guardian environment editor, Damian Carrington said recently, addressing his journalism colleagues, we are all climate journalists now. What he meant, I think, is that if your work is not already shaped by our situation in a vastly changing environment, it's going to be soon. Everything we do, we do under the force of a changing climate. And yet, I fear, we are somehow still learning to speak of climate change in the present tense. Our language lags behind our experiences. Some studies indicate that even people who care about climate change don't talk about it often. My sense um, is that many of us don't quite know how, and we don't really want to. Carrie Norgard's 2011 book, Living in Denial, described the lives of Norwegians in a skiing town during their first winter with no snow. One of them called their own practiced silence about the changing climate, a skill, an art of living. The facts are big, too big to face a lot of the time. And a lot of what we take for granted as life is implicated in them too deeply for the discussion to be comfortable or even to make much sense, I think. Sometimes seems to me, perhaps especially while reading Amitav Ghosh, as though the categories I have available for thinking and talking and writing with, the ones given to me by my Anglo-American culture and education are failing. I'm not always sure I have the resources of mind and spirit that would be required to know what a good life is now. Our generation is not the first, of course, to face ecological and cultural devastation wrought by human powers and to find that practical reason itself might be failing us. I've been thinking again lately about Jonathan Lear's Radical Hope, his 2006 book about Chief Plenikus, an important leader of the Crow or Upsaluka people of North America. Plenikus was the leader who shepherded the Upsaluka through the period in which they gave up their traditional nomadic way of life in the Yellowstone River Valley under the force of US colonial violence and settled on a reservation in Montana in the late 19th century. They exchanged hunting on the plains and fighting with the Sioux for settled life on territory that was consistently encroached upon by the United States. Plenikus recounted this experience as basically the end of everything. He said to the white man who wrote down his story in 1930, Frank Linderman, when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. After this, nothing happened. Lear's book asks what it might mean to take Plenty Coup's words as true. Somehow, when the buffalo went away, things themselves ceased happening. Lear suggests that the loss of the buffalo and associated traditional nomadic life was, in a sense, 
the end of practical reason, the end of the possibility that any intelligible thing could happen. Because living on the reservation, the crow no longer had a viable conception of the good life. Pretty Shield, one of Plenty Coup's contemporaries, told Linderman, I am living a life I do not understand. And yet for Pliny Coups, Lear writes, these were the circumstances in which he was called upon to act. Pliny Coups was the leader of a nation, required to act, but without concepts for understanding what that could possibly mean in these circumstances. And yet, part of what Pliny Coups and the Crow achieved in Lear's telling was incredibly to find a way through the end of everything. In that context, living with the category, without the categories that used to govern their lives, Pliny Coups in Lear's account performed the incredible task of transforming the virtues that had shaped traditional crow living toward new ends. So here, we're gonna get to chickadees. One key to this new vision of crow life turned out to be a dream Pliny Coups had as a young person, a dream about a chickadee who survives a storm. In this dream, a voice said, listen, Plenty Coos, it is that in that tree is the lodge of the chickadee. He is least in strength, but strongest of mind among his kind. He is willing to work for wisdom. The chickadee person is a good listener. Nothing escapes his ears, which he has sharpened by constant use. Whenever others are talking together of their successes and failures, there you will find the chickadee person listening to their words. So the chickadee became an example to Pliny Coups of the kind of person he should be, living and leading through devastation. Most of all, the chickadee listens and learns from others. In Lear's interpretation, chickadee listening is not a first order virtue of the kind the crow cultivated in their traditional way of life. It does not specify what skills to learn or for what or from whom. As Lear writes, the only substantive commitment embodied in the chickadee virtue is that if one listens and learns from others in the right way, even in radically different circumstances, even with the collapse of one's world, something good will come of it. This is the virtue Pliny Coups thought was required when all you know is that you don't have any idea what is coming or how anything good might come out of it. Chickadee virtue is for times like that. It's the virtue required to regain practical reason through catastrophic loss. Branka Arsic's book, Bird Relics, which Matthew mentioned at the beginning, it's a beautiful and moving book about Thoreau, appeals to Lear's description of the way of the chickadee as a mode of reading Thoreau. What she calls her affirmative reading conducts itself as a chickadee might, listening carefully to the strangeness and difference of Thoreau. Borrowing the phrase from Lear, she works as what she calls a bird philosopher, in part, it seems, in homage to Thoreau himself, for whom she recounts, birds are everywhere. She writes, they are everywhere in his journal and his walks because they are always on his mind as he learns their different languages, caught in a genuine bird becoming process. Arsic points out that for Thoreau too, as for Lear, Chickadees are extraordinary beings ready to listen to and follow what is different. So there you, she doesn't make explicit, but you see that the chickadee might be a model for the drummer passage where he says, uh, you listen to a different drummer and follow what you hear. That's what the chickadee does. Jane Bennett has also written about Thoreau's attention to chickadees and a moment in Walden where his relationship with them seemed to express the fulfillment of his longing to be an inhabitant of nature himself. In her 2002 book, Thoreau's Nature, she points to the moment in Walden in Winter Animals when Thoreau described a chickadee alighting on an armful of wood he was carrying. Bennett wrote that it was one of his best moments at Walden. That was because, as she described, it had shown him something about what it looks like to become part and parcel of nature, a position he advocated at the beginning of the essay, Walking. That moment with the chickadee in Walden probably draws on a passage from Thoreau's journal, one that I describe in some detail in my recent book. Um, that book, my book, uses religion and related key terms as critical categories with which to interpret Walden and argues that this mode of interpretation can resist caricatures of Thoreau as a social, a political, and a religious. 
It tries to show how Thoreau's sociality, his politics and religion are all of a piece, composing a kind of religious practice I describe in the book as a form of political asceticism oriented by delight. I take Thoreau's moment with the chickadee as an example of the interspecies sociality that Thoreau experienced at Walden and sought to represent in the book. In the passage from the journal, Thoreau's not alone with the chickadee. Alex Arian, the woodchopper, is with him, having come to visit during Thoreau's first winter living at the pond. Thoreau is chopping wood and some chickadees come by, pecking around. Thoreau and Therian discuss chickadees, what the words are for the birds in English and in French. And Therian talks about how often they join him for lunch in the woods and how much he likes to have them come around. Thoreau writes in the journal, just then one flew up from the snow and perched on the wood I was holding in my arms and pecked it and looked me familiarly in the face. Chickadee dee 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 while others were whistling Phoebe Phoebe in the woods behind the house. The language of the chickadee appears in the journal, which I take a, 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 as a sign of Thoreau's respect for it. In an early draft of my book, I made this point, but I described the words of the chickadee as indecipherable. A wise advisor asked whether I knew this for sure. So I did some research about what chickadees mean when they call. And what I found made me think that Thoreau might have taken chickadees as an example of something more than listening. So research on chickadee vocalizations is active and ongoing among biologists who have documented that chickadees convey quite complex information in their calls. One of the most important calls they make is described by the literature as a mobbing call, an alarm call. Chickadees make it in response to a threat, often a predator, and they convey all kinds of detail about predator type, size, directionality, and urgency. One early article in this literature from 2002 said that this social signal appears to serve as an alert to other chickadees, causing them to rally to the vicinity of the predator and join in a chorus of calling. In some cases, the mob that joins in not only warns other chickadees with their calls, but eventually harasses the predator away. Chickadees are tiny birds. They are cute. They are good listeners. And they can also, when they come together, make a hawk, give up the hunt. I have to think that Thoreau and Syrian who listened to chickadees would have known this too. So my interpretation of Walden takes this powerful, fierce fact about the chickadee as a kind of touchstone for what Thoreau was trying to achieve in the book. It's a beautiful polished thing revised over eight drafts into something that sparkles. And it demonstrated Thoreau's deep commitment to listening. But it was also something like an alarm call, a warning that then present economies and philosophies of nature were undoing something in the fabric of being itself. Such a call expressed a hope on Thoreau's part, I think, that the writing life could be something like a chickadee life. Lots of listening for sure, lots of learning from others in the right way, but also a call to others. And I hope that we can build a mob together. Thoreau thought he might be like the chickadee and his writing might be like a chickadee's call. Can you hear me? Will you join me? I wrote the book I did because I had the sense that even those scholars who focused quite closely on Thoreau's religion usually underemphasized the sense in which religiosity undergirded his political commitment to justice for all beings. Sometimes scholars described him as he described himself as a mystic. And in so doing, I think they sometimes unintentionally participated in a long history in which the ascetic practices taken up by religious mystics have been depoliticized, represented as spiritual in a sort of otherworldly sense, when in many emblematic cases, ascetics like these have also been at the same time, economic reformers taking aim at wealth inequality and labor injustice. I thought this meant that contemporary followers of Thoreau should take a different lesson from Walden than they usually had. And so by offering the description of Walden that I have, I also hoped to transform Thoreau's place in environmental thought, where I'm convinced that his reception in the 20th century United States was distorted by white supremacy and growing wealth inequality. It was too easy for elite white readers living in an apartheid society 
to read the middle passages of Walden as an endorsement of their loving relationships to nature, while ignoring the sense in which the book also condemned their wealth and class advantage as a symptom of a society that was still ignoring the radical economy of the Christian gospel. As Drew Lanham said last year at the Thoreau Society, that part got washed out because it was inconvenient to talk about. But the politics of our own time gives us the opportunity now, I think, to read Walden with a critical view on the ways in which 20th century politics may have distorted its reception. And that's the reading of Walden that my book aims to provide, one that can show how for Thoreau, commitment to a flourishing ecology was also commitment to a just economy. And all of that was part of a holistic, if idiosyncratic, religious life that he was hoping to call others into. Preparing for this talk, I went back to the chickadee literature to see if there was anything new I should see in the ongoing work of the biologists. And there was an article from 2020 that I hadn't seen earlier, a study about how traffic noise affects chickadee calls. They, like us, are living in rapidly changing environments. Traffic noise can mask their calls, interfering with their ability to work together to resist threats. What the study found is that chickadees alter their calls in response to traffic noise. They seem to talk around it. I find myself usually less capable these days. Climate change often leaves me speechless. How to transform our teaching and ourselves when we stand as authorities in front of a generation facing the sixth extinction and an unlivable future is not a conversation I know how to have. Words fail me. When I am feeling struck by silence in this way, as I often am, overwhelmed, afraid, and just plain sad, I find myself turning again to Thoreau, who, as Branka Arsic argued so beautifully, shaped his life around a kind of perpetual mourning, not only concerned with thinking about what grief is, but through his writing life, especially constantly reckoning with what is passing away. She wrote that her reading of Thoreau tells the story of extreme grief and its ethics, an ethic so dedicated to the loss that it is reluctant to be prevented by sophisticated ontological divides from pursuing its effort to recover what it grieves for. Thoreau insisted that what was lost, even lost to death, persists and might be found again. He can also teach us something, I think, about gathering together like the chickadees do to defend the things that need not pass away. Thank you. Thank you, Alda, that was beautiful. Um, so Jane, um, your, your turn. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Alda. Um, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. I never tire of Thoreau and always enjoy being with others who are also infected by him. So thank you for the invitation. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen. There we go. Okay, so Thoreau was a man of influence by which I mean not only that he made significant contributions to what would become American romanticism or echo philosophy, but also that he was unusually sensitive to outside influences, to the impress of things seen and unseen. He knew himself to be vulnerable, for example, to the seep of social conventions and he experimented as everyone knows with a variety of prophylactics against them such as practices of walking, civil disobedience, cultivating friendship with plants and animals, um, avoiding newspapers. But Thoreau was also very susceptible to what he called natural influences, to the lure of non-human or not quite human bodies, forces, or atmospheres. Um, and in contrast to his presumptive wariness of societal impressions, Thoreau actively courted the incursion of natural influences. Um, let's see, I go this way. Hmm. There we go. Um, if I am too cold for human friendship, I trust I shall not soon be too cold for natural influences. So I want to focus a little bit on this notion of natural influences, which are able to disrupt habits of perception and derail trains of thought. They reorient percepts and concepts by offering new distractions, 
new sites of attention, affection, and interest. Thoreau, one could say, has faith in natural influences, faith in their power to lure him more deeply into life, into the alluringly weird every day. Noteworthy to Thoreau and to me is the peculiar kind of causality in which natural influences participate. This causality is an exceedingly subtle and what he calls ethereal efficacy. It's a transformational power that is significant but not efficient, he says, in the essay Moonlight. Um, as an example of this sort of shy, sly, or quote, secret influence, Thoreau offers the crimson cloud on the horizon that boots his imagination. The crimson cloud on the horizon excites me, stirs my blood, makes my thoughts flow, and I have new and indescribable fancies. Influence enacts itself by, uh, in ways that operate more or less below the radar. Uh, it's it, below the radar of cognitive um, attention and also sensuous, explicit sensuous attention. It, uh, it, this kind of efficacy is vague and an exact atmosphere. It induces effects quietly, indirectly, without fan, fanfare, and often at the very margins, as I said, of cognitive and sensuous detection. What I'd like to do, uh, explore briefly tonight, is one of Thoreau's encounters with natural influences. Um, and these are those emanating from the sort of snow, sand, clay thawing along, alongside the railroad embankment, the famous passage from the spring chapter of Walden. Um, evidence that these materials and their movement style have influence, are affecting despite their ethereality, is the fact that they give Thoreau, I will argue, a greater access to a kind of surreal, virtual, or psychedelic strata of his own existence, a strata that's always co-present with more easily noted modes of experience. So in that famous passage of the spring chapter of Walden, Thoreau recounts his fascination by the eruption of sand foliage by the train tracks. Um, and here I, I mentioned the word fascination, and I'm thinking of the surrealist Roger, Roger Caillois' sense of fascination as an effect of the lyrical force, that's Caillois' uh, term of art, of the lyrical force of an object, an object that is able to arrest the natural restlessness of human attention and kind of like fixate you on something. Now, the particular object of fascination here is a shape I'm going to, uh, for Thoreau. It's the shape of a cascade of lobed leaves made out of snow, sand, and clay. On the embankment, snow is melting and running down, as is the sand and clay underneath, each material moving at a slightly different pace, but forming overlapping conjoining flows. Here's the, that's a photograph someone has taken. Um, of, of an image that seems to suit this passage. Innumerable little streams overlap and interlace, exhibiting a sort of hybrid product which obeys halfway the law of currents and halfway that of vegetation. As it flows, it takes the forms of sappy leaves or vines making heaps of pulpy sprays a foot or more in depth. It is a truly grotesque vegetation, more ancient than acanthus, chicory, ivy, vine, or any vegetable leaves, destined perhaps under some circumstances to become a puzzle to future geologists. Now it's noteworthy to Thoreau that water, sand, and clay, mineral elements, have taken on a shape, leafy vines, characteristic of vegetal life, now the sand foliage's indifference to the matter life distinction prompts Thoreau to conclude that there is nothing inorganic. He also says that in the spring chapter. Um, and in a journal entry of December 31st on, in 1851, Thoreau had already noted, quote, that the earth I tread on is not a dead inert mass, it is a body, is organic and fluid to the influence of its spirit. Now in a second wild thought, Thoreau pro proclaims that the similarity in shape between sand foliage and leafy vines indicates a certain, maybe you could call it geologic capacity for ideation. Sand foliage is evidence, he says, of the earth's quote, inward musings about a favorite, fa favored shape, he says. Um, 
you thus find in the very sands an anticipation of the vegetable leaf. No wonder that the earth expresses itself outwardly in leaves, it so labors with the idea inwardly. That's the row from the spring chapter. This organic spewing ideating earth susceptible to influences emanating from visible bodies as well as for, from ethereal forces is the particular puzzle that Thoreau wants to leave for quote future geologists. The next section is called the drop. So we're gonna move from the shape of the leaf and the lobe, although there's a little bit of a drop like quality to it um, to his passage where he talks about drops. The earth, like Thoreau's own sensitive body, is, quote, all alive and covered with papillae. He regularly courts the influence of a premeditating living earth, which, like the aforementioned crimson cloud, also stirs his blood and excites new and indescribable fancies, end quote. Among those fancies is the idea that clay, water, sand, vines, and, as we shall see in the following passage, human flesh, is each an expression of a more universal prototype. Everybody, Thoreau cries out, is a variation on the theme of the drop or the moist, thick lobe. What is man but a mass of thawing clay? The ball of the human finger is but a drop congealed. The fingers and toes flow to their extent from the thawing mass of the body. The nose is a manifest congealed drop of stalactite. The chin is, still, is a still larger drop, the confluent dripping of the face. The cheeks are a slide from the brows into the valley of the face. Each rounded lobe of the vegetable leaf too is a thick and now loitering drop. The lobes are the fingers of the leaf. Okay, so you got the drop, the, the, the lobe of the leaf, and please take a note of his nose. Okay, the lobe, the drop of the nose, yes. Thoreau here seems to be invoking a homologically oriented, wor ordered world, a homologically oriented world. Homology, writes Branka Arsic, is quote, a form of reasoning that takes similarities of, for example, shape to be but copies or repetitions of an original type or ideal essence. In Branca's our introduction to a recent edited volume called Dispersions, Thoreau and Vegetal Thought, she makes a very convincing case that Thoreau's writing tended to favor rolling analogies over homologies, because in these rolling analogies do not limb differences as only variations on a single theme. And, and the analogical form is, uh, Branca suggests, um, is more faithful to a Thoreauian ontology of, quote, weakly individuated processual phenomena that continue into what they aren't. Arsic cites this passage um, from the journal of April 21st, 1854 as an example of Thoreau's use of analogies. Oops. Go. As I go up the hill beyond the brook, while the high loads, that's the frogs, that red frogs, and there's another little one over there. Um, as I go up the hill beyond the brook, while the high loads are heard behind, I perceive the faintest possible flower-like scent as from the earth, reminding me of anemones and houstonias. Can it be the budded mouse ears under my feet? That's the bottom picture there. Um, downy swaddled, they lie along flat to the earth like a child on its mother's bosom. But here's Arsage. The scent is like the flower, which is like the earth, only because the earth is like anemones that are like Houstonias that are like a child. So um, this is a really interesting theme to me about Thoreau's use of analogy vis-a-vis -vis, um, homology. And I'll just offer a question perhaps for our discussion. Is that sand foliage passage an instance of homology or analogy? The homology, you know, with the with the prototype, or is it more this sort of rolling analogies, where, um, as Franca says, um, um, it's uh, consistent with Thoreau's ontology of quote weakly individuated processual phenomena that continue into what they aren't. Okay, so we can leave that perhaps for discussion. But what seems clear to me is that some strange shit is going on as Thoreau writes up his encounters on the embankment. 
um, as if on an LSD trip, very ordinary things, his nose, ivy, some clay and sand in a ditch, detach from their usual context to reappear, to use Dietrich Diederichsen's description of psychedelic experience, to reappear as sublime ridiculous. Each entity dilates and blurs at its edges to enter a dripping cosmic morphology, which seems more consistent with Branca's uh, 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 depiction of Thoreau's use of rolling analogies. What happens to the nose, ivy, clay, sand, and water also happens to the letters of the alphabet that Thoreau is using to write it up. Conscious of what he says is a, quote, slight insanity in his mood, Thoreau now sees the letters of the word lobe as themselves iterations of that globe drop shape. He's, he writes, the radicals of lobe are LB, the soft mass of the B, single lobed, or B, or capital B, double lobed, with the liquid L pressing behind the liquid L behind it pressing forward. It's such a weird idea, I have a hard time reading it. Okay, so he's conscious of a slight insanity of his mood. He's been seeing the prototypes of the drops all over the place. And now he sees the letters of the word lobe as itself, as themselves iterations of the globe drop, of the glob drop shape. Quote, the radicals of the lobe are LB, the soft mass of the lowercase b, single lobed, or uppercase B, double lobed, with the liquid L behind it, pressing it forward. Okay, the last section, then I'll stop, is called winged thoughts. At the embankment, Thoreau's thoughts, affected by natural influences in that subtle, ethereal, under the radar way, um, his thoughts take flight. He writes, you find in the very sands an anticipation of the vegetable leaf. The leaf sees its prototype in the shape of a moist, thick lobe. The ball of the human finger is but a drop congealed. The chin is a still larger drop, the confluent dripping of the face. What is man but a mass of thawing clay?" End quote. So natural influences emanating from the sandy slope alongside the railroad, as well as from the shape of his nose and the letters of the alphabet, start to loosen the grip of ordinary perception. New perceptions arise, and so do winged thoughts, which, quote, like birds, do not tolerate too much handling. Okay, so Thoreau's thoughts, in the presence of natural influences, they leap and overshoot. And his account of the thawing bank is both overdone and also elusive. But he takes these to be virtues, this, to, be, to, do think, to overdo things and you know, to exaggerate and also to be somewhat elusive. Um, he, he takes those to be virtues. In a journal entry on Christmas day in 1851, he contrasts explanations that are governed by the understanding with the truer discipline of a writer who takes, quote, the faintest intimations and the least film of thought that floats in the twilight sky of his mind for his theme. I'm teaching a seminar this semester on Lucretius um, who had this idea of uh, simulacra, which are the sort of outer layer of the atoms of any formed thing that float around in the world and, and um, impact, the, they, they're taken in by the very fine pores of your body and they impact your thinking. And I, it's interesting to me now here that Thoreau wrote in 1851 um, of the discipline of a writer who takes the faintest intimations and the least film of thought that floats in the twilight sky of his mind for his theme, end quote. The poet who allows his words to shoot beyond their mark drifts closer to the truth of things. He's better able to translate a natural influence whose efficacy is not linguistic into words, end quote, to express that natural influence without expressing yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna just stop there, just with some sort of the psychedelic Thoreau and his faith in natural influences. Oh, that was wonderful, thank you. Psychedelic Thoreau, uh, let me get this ready and go there. Well, thank you, uh, Matthew and Branca, as well as my fellow co-panelist, uh, Jane and Alda. I am so pleased to be here with all of you this evening, um, here in the Zoom machine, 
talking about a person and a perspective that might perhaps be at odds with the very conditions that make possible this conversation, as well as other missives about an ongoing climate catastrophe. Exhibit A, I begin with. Walden, the game. Which will, throughout this presentation, be shared with each of you as I ramble through my remarks. Attend as you wish to this exploratory narrative and open world simulation of Thoreau's life during his experiment in self-reliant living at Walden Pond. The game follows the loose narrative of Thoreau's first year in the woods, with each season holding its own challenges for survival and possibilities for inspiration. And as the devastating advertising copy reads, play deliberately. But before moving into questions concerning our technological surround, I'm going to spend some time with all this game-changing book that does much to reframe Thoreau as a writer with whom we might engage and learn from as we navigate the various crises of our modernity, crises which do more than resemble those of Thoreau's scene of writing. Systematic racism, environmental degradation, instrumental reasoning, political and economic injustices as far as the eye can see, wars and rumors of wars, ethical docility and blithe acceptance of our technological surround, an epidemic of looking and a paucity of seeing, the commodification of conscience, the misapplication of our powers of attention, and a general commitment to complacency as a neighborly virtue, etc., etc. It is precisely the way in which Thoreau shows how these diagnoses are interconnected and mutually constructive, part of what he might call a sustaining atmosphere, that marks him as a profoundly religious, political, and ethical thinker. And it is crucial to note that Thoreau's diagnosis is largely of his white neighbors who busy themselves with questions of free trade and fall asleep scrolling the prices current and taking in the military spectacles at home and abroad. Mysticism is devious and dirty work in Alda's reading of Thoreau. A refreshing insight to be sure, and one that rescues Thoreau a bit from his worst Protestant proclivities. For Thoreau, writes Alda, religion was not simply a matter of interiority, but rather a practice, a virtuous living and daily orienting oneself to all that might be considered sacred. But as Alda writes, religion for Thoreau also signified long habits and experimental, experiential grooves that in their sustaining ways did much to replicate the successful disciplining of subjects by the state akin to the disciplining of initiates for life within a religious institution. And to be sure, Thoreau, Thoreau was an acerbic critique, uh, critic of forms of bad religion, right? A huge critic of bad religion that he believed wanting in their substance and form attachments that he thought kept us from the good. Alda here extends the work of the historian in, 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 in sort of seeing Thoreau in this kind of multiplicity in his multiplicity, extends the work of Catherine Albanese, whose revolutionary reframing of American religious history against church historians in the 1970s did much to focus scholarly attention on the mystical habits of Thoreau as a form of metaphysical piety. Albanese was trying to call our attention to religion as it exists outside the devotional form and liturgical genre. But whereas Albanese did not necessarily push on the political and ethical dimension of Thoreau's piety, Alda does to great interpretive effect, framing Thoreau as a fraught Protestant born of an emerging secular imaginary, that is, an imaginary invested in demarcating true religion from false. So to pay attention then to how and why Thoreau attends to his world is to witness religion in action. As Alda writes, quote, Thoreau's writing practice was at the center of his political asceticism a contemplative practice that is counterintuitively political and generates definitive forms of sociality. For in, cultivating, for in cultivating his own habits of attention in the act of writing, Thoreau is able to attend to his attention, reorienting himself and preparing for what Aldo calls a true sociality. It is by sanely standing beside himself in the act of writing, seeing himself seen, as it were, that Thoreau begins to slough off his common habits and the cheap social mores that have made their way in. In the act of writing, at once descriptive, coy, critical, confessional, Thoreau becomes awakened to other people and obligations. 
oh, excuse me. Um, he becomes awakened to other people and their particularity, attending to otherness that demands reimagining of social ties and obligations. And it is precisely this kind of political piety in the text that provides inspiration for Thoreau's readers, Alda tells us, who might be inclined to conjure the same audience as he and to integrate parts of human experience that might otherwise be alienated from one another. Moreover, the political piety manifest in Walden, she writes, becomes a collective object of attention over time, a scripture by any other name that informs, instructs, and initiates readers into a collective, ongoing, and living tradition of interpretation. It is the writing as an act of, of meta-reflection that is pertinent here, the doubleness that writing can produce, a mode of communication in which the writer tends to the object at hand, even as she tends to the relationship that she is forging between herself and that object in acts of creative description. This doubleness that writing induces is perhaps what Thoreau called the conscience, the necessary splitting of the individual that allows not only for one to think about thinking, but also to tend to others in that very same act. I was very taken with Alda's description of all of this, and especially the caveats and skeptical questions she injects along the way. Alda notes that even, um, even though Thoreau recognized the potential pitfalls of inhabiting such a state of meta-reflection, um, he, he, he considers how that state can, in a sense, remove himself, uh, not just from himself, but from others, and he becomes a poor neighbor and friend in that process. Indeed, one can imagine a s scenario in which the splitting of self results not in self-reflection and the privileging of conscience, but rather in self-indulgence and the reinstantiation of cheap sociality. Moreover, what to make of the potential audiences that might be conjured in the act of creating and modeling a discipline of attention for his readers? Are they even real? After reading Aldo's book, I began to imagine what Thoreau might make of or how he might tinker with our present age of algorithmic governance. So I have Exhibit B, which is an article that many of you might have seen. It was published last week in the New York Times called OK Doomer, uh, The Climate Advocates Who Say It's Not Too Late. Uh, which reported on a growing cadre of people, many of them young, who are fighting climate doomism, the notion that it's too late to turn things around. They believe that focusing solely on terrible climate news can sow dread and paralysis, foster inaction, and become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it also reported on a TikTok group of like-minded climate advocates called EcoTalk and said, that their hashtag EcoTalk, or hashtag EcoTalk, has more than 200 million views. The story of EcoTalk um, broaches an important question. Um, is, is it possible, under current techno media conditions, for collaborations to counteract threats to human flourishing? Is there potential for a single call to catalyze a response, to catalyze another call, to catalyze a response? just as the chickadees do in Walden. Significantly, the New York, Time art, New York Times article posits a suspect dichotomy when it frames the debate over what role individual actions play in the cl climate crisis, given that fossil fuel companies, large corporations, and governments are responsible for the overwhelming majority of planet heating carbon emissions. For as some detractors of Ecotox suggest, focusing on an individual's impact is a useless, guilt-inducing distraction. Note here the Thoreauvian assumption of eco-talkers that amassing followers around constructive and positive messaging is action from principle, the perception and performance of right that changes things in their relations. Note too the reporter's linking of guilt and distraction with the implication being that the conscience in the age of TikTok and Twitter may no longer work in precisely the same way as Thoreau suggested it did when he defined the conscience as essentially revolutionary, dividing states and churches, families as well as the individual, separating the diabolical and someone from the divine. In a particularly lovely quip, Thoreau writes, I am not responsible for the successful working of the machinery of society. I am not the son of an engineer, unquote. 
But I suspect that Thoreau would have something to say about the contemporary compulsion to doom scroll and the various diagnoses that seek to explain our inattention to pending apocalypse. Indeed, I can imagine that Thoreau would be quite good on social media, ironically asking us why we no longer have any time to be, quote, anything but a machine, unquote. So what are the prospects of cultivating a salvific attention if we turn away from the 19th century mechanics of Thoreau's time um, to our current age of algorithm, algorithms? What happens then when folks no longer creep into the social setting of one's writing, but rather mob or ignore you based upon this or that proprietary algorithm and the higher laws of our attention economy? What might it now mean to borrow a phrase for humans to become, quote, the tools of their tools, unquote. In 1948, a century following Thoreau's experiment in deliberate living, um, political asceticism, and writerly discipline, Claudie Shannon published the Mathematical Theory of Communication. It was published in Bell Labs Technical Journal and presented to other engineers as an aid in understanding the relationship between inputs and outputs in a general communication system. Shannon's research agenda, moreover, was motivated by AT&T's drive to maximize profit and its imagined community by using its existing infrastructure more efficiently. In the decade following the publication of his groundbreaking article, Shannon witnessed the rapid uptake of information theory across numerous disciplines. For example, whereas Shannon had expressed reservations about indiscriminate application of his math mathematical theory of communication, others did not. Norbert Wiener, for example, posited information as the missing link between automatic machines and the human nervous system. According to Wiener, information was unlike anything else. Information is information, he coyly insisted not energy or matter, unquote. Wiener declared that, quote, the mechanical brain does not secrete thought as the liver does bile, as the earlier materials claimed, nor does it put out as a form, of, nor is it put out as a form of energy as the muscles put out its activity. No materialism, which does not admit this, can survive the present day, unquote. According to Wiener, information was carried along in neural nets, in control loops, and even through society itself. The nature of information as such was naturally occurring across different registers. Information could be discerned in a written passage or a social survey and represented by the charges in electron tube, et cetera, et cetera. So abstract and fungible was information that it was devoid of semantic quality until meaning was ascribed to its statistical es essence well after the fact. Yet. As a formal proposition, information was the very stuff of life itself, defined minimally as computational capacity. And this is the irony of mechanization that Thoreau would have surely appreciated. For as information theory was taken up in a neural key, driving industries and of neuroscience and information processing both, the stranger information's material status became. Like the ether of Thoreau's time, information was a subtle body. And like the ether, information was that which made humans an imminent part of the larger cosmos. It was, from a neuroscientific perspective, part mind and part body, an incarnation for which the spiritual referent, that, that which it was a materialization of, remains unnamed. As biochemist Lila Gatlin observed in 1972 in her review of information theory and biological systems, she writes, information is an ultimately indefinable or intuitive first principle like energy whose precise definition always somehow seems to slip through our fingers like a shadow, unquote. Information in other words, was a universal matter that flowed through all living things and did not change given the material body that it inhabited, even bodies that were comprised mainly of metal and vacuum tubes. Everything in the world now, in the age of TikTok, can be encoded as information, or at least 
the attempt can be made to encode. The neuronal, the psychological, the social, the economic, the moral, and the religious may all wishfully be optimized precisely because they may all be abstracted and configured as a communication system. What would Thoreau make of this, this cybernetic impulse to extend mathematical propositions into biological, social, and technological registers simultaneously? What would Thoreau make of a theory of correspondence in which information guarantee the scalability between macro and microcosm? How might Thoreau resist the accelerating accretion of ideas, capital, and practices around the notion that the, the notion of the idea of the fungibility of information, right? An accretion that now allows humans to cohere as a species and in a perverse extension of his own romanticism allows humans to become conversant at the deepest of levels with machines and storm clouds both. Thoreau, I imagine, would attend to this prospect, however, as the existential crisis that undergirds our hand-wringing and our blithe refusal to address who we are and why we act so callously when it comes to the prospect of climate catastrophe. For it is one thing, right, to make appointments with trees and to recognize a kinship across whatever might mark the human divide. It is quite another to reduce variety and difference to a calculable continuum so that everything is fungible with everything else. And it is this naturalization of nature, or more precisely, the founding assumption that information is built into nature and guarantees correspondences across all domains that Thoreau might take issue with. He might suspiciously attend to its metaphysics and the sexual and racial politics it ushers in. He might be anxious about the material worlds being assembled in its image and he might reject its first principle and final aim that communication happens in a purely statistical fashion. Surely there is something to be said here with Thoreau as my witness about the ease by which some folks fashion their spiritual selves late at night on the internet machine between the sentimental YouTube dives and the wordle addictions, the TikTok and the porn. Thank you. Thank you, John, that, that was wonderful. So uh, maybe we should start from you three guys. I mean, if you have comments or questions for one another, or... let me check the Q&A uh, box. I would like to ask Aldo about her research into the chickadees and the, the scientific literature and how they you use the phrase information. I was just wondering if that was your phrase or that was somehow they were they were sort of employing a certain kind of um, measure. Um, of... uh, when did I use the phrase information? I can tell you about the articles I've read. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they do both, they do studies both in controlled environments and observational studies in non-controlled environments. Um, the one about traffic noise, in the one about traffic noise, they played controlled traffic noise, which is quite interesting at 50 decibels. So, so they didn't find traffic noise. They went out and they like uh, made the chickadees listen to the traffic noise on their boom box. Um, but it seems like your question is about uh, how they think about information, which can you, can you articulate that part of the question for me? Because I, I want to respond to that. That's well, it's, it's more, saying. yeah, it's just more about how, I mean, in a sense, Thinking, I would, I mean, I didn't read the articles, but I would imagine the kind of contemporary biological science and thinking about, you know, the sort of communication, communicative capacities of birds would, 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 would assume certain kinds of things about the natural world. And I was just wondering, in your reading of those, how how they jive with your reading of Thoreau or or something like that, maybe. Yeah, sure. I, I was wondering about this this morning because um, so much of the new materialist literature. Um, I, worries about scientific worldviews. Um, my experience of scientists is that a lot of them are, are uh, vital materialists. 
So um, they use the methods that they that have been given to them by their traditional practices, um, but their uh, understanding of what matter is uh, is more like um, Branka Arsic and Jane Bennett's than um, like Francis Bacon's. Um, and I don't know what accounts for that. I mean, that's a question I have for Bennett. You nodded when I said this thing about scientists and I wonder what you think about how they became vital materialists, the ones that are. I don't know. Um, it, probably because they're, they work really closely with physical, physical properties and physical things and, and, and maybe because they're not as steeped in um, social scientific or humanities oriented narratives. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, I was, I was going to, I was going to ask you two, two things like, um, you know, I, it, Thoreau was very good for me at bringing out the sort of um, virtual experience I don't want to call them experiences, but this virtual register of his existence, which is weird and uh, elusive, and this not, and it always, always there. And he tries to he tries to speak it, you know. And he, he's very he's usually pretty successful about that, but it's always somewhat there's this opacity remains and such. And in you know, I, I thought talked about it as a kind of psychedelic you know, um, a strata that's always co-present with more easily noted modes of experience, we call it surreal, virtual, psychedelic. And if, for me, Thoreau, then Thoreau, since he, since he accents that, I don't think, I think he, he might say in answer to John's thing or beginning in a response to John's point, you know, everything is not fungible to everything else regardless of how many algorithms are operating here, there, and everywhere, which is not to be denied, but they're not as successful. They're not as complete. They're not as, they're not, they're, there's these undercurrent of these so-called natural influences, which are also operative. So I think he might just sort of push back on the narrative, like that, the, that those algorithms are won the day and that they, they got us all, you know, tied up in, in it, their, their, their nasty web. And then the other thing that I was thinking about, and this is just to throw this out there, is like yes, there's climate change, and it it is a, but but I'm wondering, are we in an existential crisis? That was my thought. <laughs> like <laughs> something's wrong, something's bad, something's awry. But 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 are we in an existential crisis? Or have we always been like this? Well, to be alive is to be in an existential crisis. And, and so I'm wondering whether that framing, I don't know, there's, it, it's, yes, it's, it's good, but I think I'm kind of sympathetic to those guys that, um, the, the TikTok guys that John, you were talking about, that there's something about the narrative of, of dread and crisis and existential crisis that it, it, it's somehow counter, it's, it's somehow, not doing the work we're hoping it would do. Yeah. Anyway, those are just my thoughts to, in response to, to you too. I think you're right about the narrative of dread not being effective. I mean, it, it seems to cause a lot of harm. Um, I was thinking about that as I was uh, writing the, the thing that I said today. Um, because I mean, as far as I can tell, a lot of the climate change communicators are are ha have come to consensus on this point that we need to have other stories besides the end of the world story. And um, uh, the last chapter of my book is about delight for that reason. I mean, I take a lesson from you on this. I think that that and uh, what I what I am trying to say is that Thoreau's sort of renunciative gestures are always oriented by the good that they enable, the enjoyment of real goods, and that yeah, go on. Yeah, and also the good that they enable enable. He's always holding out alternative lures. That's how I'm thinking of it now. It's it's even less like now I'm reading it less about critique. And more about these, this, this dredging up and trying to make present these alternative lures, which are co-present co with the bads, with the with the, the objects of the critique. Yeah. Yeah, it's a seduction to the good. That's the the thing that I 
yeah, that's your. That's point. why Walden. So the beginning of Walden is a tirade and ends with this critique of philanthropy because he thought Christian benevolence was paternalistic and the wrong way to interpret the gospel. And he ends with the conclusion and this didactic uh, sort of assertion. But the middle, the whole middle of Walden, is this. Uh, is a description of a way of life that would answer the question that the critique of, of philanthropy asked, which was what, what does it really mean to live out the gospel? And it turns out that what it means is this beautiful thing that you should want anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, Jen, I agree. I agree. I think Thoreau would be resistant and have pretty smart things to say about this sort of wish for closure and the kind of, you know, the sort of natural resistance that the human might sort of pose to that. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about, which I didn't, was the diagnosis uh, in the 1960s of information overload, which is this kind of pathology of these things happen, too much information coming at you. And, uh, you know, it has it has a history going back to George Beard and neurasthenia. You know, kind of fast forward into Internet addiction and, you know, various forms of ADHD and things like that. Um, but what's interesting about that, that diagnosis in the 1960s that sort of continues on in various ways is, you know, this assumption that, that somehow data or information is, is sort of coming at you through, through, through just through media, right? Where I always, I always bring up Thoreau in this point. It's like, you know, when Thoreau looks at a tree, Overload. He's he over he's overloaded, right? He's there's a psychedelic experience because he's attending to, you know, and he's trained himself and cultivated a certain mode of of seeing the world that um, is sort of always kind of coming up against. And I think you do a good job, Jane, of showing that kind of psychedelic horizon sometimes of what he's what he's after. Um, and so that sort of this begs the question of how are we, in a sense, orienting ourselves? How are we or how are we cultivating our attention in light? Of these machines, to what degree are we buying in to their promises and their claims to perhaps our detriment? Yeah. Okay, I, I actually have a, a question. Um, question for uh, Jane. Um, I was curious what you make on the violence that seems to haunt Thoreau's description of the sand flaws because Thoreau describes the flaws, it seems to me, in the terms of a dissection in phrases like sandy rupture, a cave laid open to the light, and suggests that the cuts near the vitals of the globe. It seems to me like there is something unsettling here in Thoreau's ebullience in his analogies, homologies through this section of spring. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda, for that question. It's a great one. Um, yeah, I haven't, I think it's worth thinking about. A lot of the imagery here is, is um, like he calls it excremental, or there's some, there's some adjective that's like that, that it's got excrement in it. Um, it's like the, the vitals of the globe are being like vomited out and, and um, or excreted out. And there's a kind of, um, there's a, I think it has to do with him noting differentials in speed. So there's like the slow, gentle thaw, but sometimes it's, but sometimes these natural influences also take, they take the form of the slow, gentle thaw, but sometimes also they're, they have a more explosive temporality, a quick, a quick change thing. So I, I haven't thought a lot about that, about the, about the violence. Um, I haven't thought a lot about it. I would probably start to think about it in terms of the rose accounting of the variability of tempos, tempos of change and tempos of movement and rhythms and, and um, what I've been thinking about in terms of movement styles. Um, yeah, I would probably resist or postpone trying to translate that violence into political terms and making some kind of parallel to what he thinks about the natural violence and the, and the sort of violence of wars or I would I would kind of wait on that for a bit um, I like to postpone that link because I think it's really easy for me as being in a political science department all these years to give the pol the political discourse the and also 
concerns for injustice make you want to use the political discourse, but the political discourse is super reductive and super unsubtle and throws so much better than that. So I, I so so maybe others might want to make that translation to a political discourse, but I probably would I probably would postpone that a little bit. I'm thinking about Branka Arsic's work uh, uh, about the his his resistance to the um, to typology in scientific categorization and wondering uh, if you have like where else he's interested in dissection. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here to take. The, I mean, I don't want to take time from from you guys. I just want to kind of um, add, if I may, a, a, a short sentence. If we do not go, and I totally agree with you, Jane, um, in the political um, direction, but for instance, in the ontological um, direction, at the moment when he's describing flows, which are by definition unformed, every figuration uh, insofar as it is the moment of separation or the introduction of discreteness or a difference, um, is a severance and is therefore also a moment of, of violence. Um, so how would one um, kind of isolate a lobe um, out of the flow where there are no lobes uh, unless there would be some sort of, of carving um, or, or cutting. Um, but, but I also think that um, he, he sees those flows as both injurious and, and healing, um, as opposed to just kind of reading into it this kind of um, negative force of, um, and pain of, of, of severance. Mm -hmm. That's also, it really kind of brings up a kind of interesting thing about a kind of historicity of the psychedelic experience. You know, so much of the way in which we talk about psychedelic psychedelic experiences are kind of based around a sort of synesthesia sort of thing where things collapse into other things. And, you know, I think in a way you're bringing out perhaps there's a slightly different way in which Thoreau is following. He's like he's looking for the ruptures. He's looking for something quite different than just basically making fungible your hearing with your vision or something like that, which is, you know, I'm, I'm seeing music and things like that, which is, you know, wonderful, but it's, uh, it has a certain kind of moment, right, and a desire um, with the development of a vocabulary around psychedelica in the 1950s and 1960s, and, and, you know, the kinds of insights that the new sciences gave us and the new vocabularies they gave us to describe these experiences. Durow seems like somebody who, you know, to sort of pull that out really kind of has an interesting uh, sort of counter, perhaps, um, experience that is both psychedelic. Yeah, he has other examples of it. Like he talks, there's several places where he talks about being under the influence of ether when he goes to the dentist. And um, also um, he he cites, I, I forget which book it was in, um, th this psychedelic plant that the, the colonists had accidentally eaten as a salad um, in Jamestown, I think. And um, where was that? I forget where that was in, in um, maybe on Cape Cod, maybe it's the Cape Cod piece. Um, so he is interested in, um, well, I think one of his techniques for learning how to live well in a natural world, in, in, a, in a cosmos that is, as Branca puts it, always under, always becoming otherwise than itself, which is disorienting and upsetting and violent, but also the way it is and the possibility of existence. Um, he's interested in, um, in maybe a deliberate, more deliberate or artistic practice of coping with that, the, the, the psychedelic component of, of that. Um, I think it's not just about, you know, calming himself or walking or noticing, it's about being, well, yeah, it's like about being in the wild, like the disorientation of the wild, but, hmm. but it's, you have to court it to make it explicit, but you don't have, to, but it's always there already, I think. He's always, you're always in a strange world. Um, yeah. I think that, yeah. That, and there is, a, that we have a, another question from Ryan Carr uh, for Professor Modern, inspired by Professor B.L.'s proposal that Walden is about coming around via nature 
to what the gospel wants you to do anyway. Can the same point be applied to conscious? Is Thoreau's concept of conscious a holdover from early American theological traditions? The way you were talking about conscious sounded a little more like Adam Smith's impartial mm. spectator. Yeah, no. Hi, Ryan. Um, yeah. Um... I, I think I think that's I think that's a great point. Um, you know, the I, I mean, I think my my comments on consciousness come from obviously his essay on civil disobedience. I was kind of quoting that a lot in my talk. Um, you know, but it's that it's that rupture where I, I think, yeah, I think it does. It's a it's a certain kind of secular translation, perhaps even. Um, you know, that's I use that word loosely, but I think that's that is something that's going on. The way in which he is sort of divorcing it from perhaps a kind of anthropocentric notion of God um, and, and trying to sort of move toward, you know, this idea of starting to uh, assume a kind of meta perspective, you know, on yourself and the sort of desires to sort of reach those levels of consciousness or epistemological insight. Yeah, and John, maybe you could say a bit more about because I that that sounded right to me that conscience doesn't work in the revolutionary way that Thoreau had hoped. I mean, more and more I see that the sort of sting of exposing hypocrisy doesn't do that much, which was like a number one, you know, tool in your in your political tool bag is yeah. to expose hypocrisy and you know appeal to conscience, and it does it doesn't seem to be operating yeah. the same way. So maybe you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, I think that that sort of is inspired by when I teach Thoreau and I and I really almost focus like almost like an hour on that passage where he's like it splits people, it splits individuals, it splits families, this kind of thing where it's sort of getting into the territory where I think we're in the last few minutes talking about that that sort of appreciation for rupture and disruption that that Thoreau pushes on. I, I have found that lesson increasingly less. I found my students uh, being less attractive to that over the course of my 17, 18 years of teaching. When I first started teaching that, and I think Ryan was in my first class I ever taught in 2003, uh, you know, that, that class, that, that, I think that lesson had a different resonance than it does now where that notion of conscience seems insane. Why, why, would, why would you do that? Well, that's not the message you're receiving. That is not the message that their family's telling them. And increasingly, that's not the message that universities or colleges are also sort of promoting. Um, there's something there's something that's changed, and I think that that comment kind of comes from that, that that sensitivity to that. Yeah, this is one of the things I meant to say when I mean uh, uh, I don't know what it means to live a good life anymore. Like, um, it strikes me that I'm I'm doing a thing which um, I'm doubting when I think that some change in my view of, of what the world is would, would affect how I behave and what politics becomes. That, that's, a, that's something I was taught to believe and that now I know the, mm -hmm. the climate change is caused by infrastructure, right? So I wonder, not just if anything I do makes a difference because like things I do do make a difference, but, but I wonder how how to think about what a good life is in a, a scale that I can't fathom. Like no one taught me that humans could have this kind of power and I don't know how to live in that. Yeah. You know, Alda, that phrase that you pulled out from Jonathan Lear's book about, is it Plenicue? Plenicue? Um, after, the, after the Buffalo, after this, nothing happened. Um, it's, it's interesting you pulled that out because then you show that actually things do happen afterwards. But so maybe and, and one of my PhD students is working on just that line um, um, because he's trying to think about he's putting a lot of pressure on the word nothing, no thing, no thing happened, but lots of lots of process happens. So I wonder if that's along the lines that you're thinking, too, maybe. Yeah, and what one of the yeah. things Lear says is what he so so Plenicus go, goes on to say um, 
you know what happened after that. Like you could tell after that, you could tell the story as well as I can because we're in this new, what Lear, Lear's interpretation is that we're in a new discursive space where like we're using your words. The, the story, the, the words that I used to use, the, the concepts I used to have, the way of life I understood, I can tell you about that. But once the Buffalo were gone, I can't tell you about that anymore. Like the 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 concepts that I had available to tell you what thing, how history worked, that 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 is over. And and after that, you you know the story. Like there's just a radical a disjunct because that the the practical reasoning that I relied on upon before that it has ended. And, and he, I mean, Lear's second chapter and third chapter goes on to, to make this point. Like it wasn't that nothing happened, obviously, like the, the interpretive work that they went on to do made the, the Absoluka are like a vibrant people today, right? So um, yeah, it's a complicated way. It's a complicated thing to, to both recognize the end of the world and yeah. see how it carries on in traditional means. I mean, I think that's what Lear's book is trying to accomplish. And, and I, I think the reason it resonated then and the reason I'm looking at it now again is this question I have, like, I don't know how to think about what a good life is. Well, that's a gloomy um, <laughs> sentence <laughs> to kind of end on. But well, it, maybe you don't have to think about it. Maybe you just kind of muddle your way into it. But yeah, and I, I mean, what I, what I do, I don't want to end on the gloom either. The thing, <laughs> the thing I am trying to do is to join something. That's why the chickadee is important to me because, because as um, I mean, I think um, uh, influx and efflux is sort of about this, like the, the, and, and vibrant matter is too, the, the distributed aid, we only have distributed agency. And so right. the thing that we have available to us is to like be with other people and things and animals and everything else like to, mm -hmm. to recognize your agency as distributed as and to act accordingly is it is a quick question is there any way i mean i'm totally into distributed agency is there ways in which are we concerned about how that sort of you know ontological point is just so correspondent to the social media environment that we live in what i mean that seems to be that's that's what i was trying to push on like there's something weird there that 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 insight has been co-opted or perhaps generated and then co-opted by a certain kind of scientific perspective and techno media perspective that we find ourselves now sort of unable to join unable to sort of appreciate the splitting uh, you know all these kinds of blocks and obstacles that we're having epistemologically to think about the issues before us that was the question I had about your talk, John. It was like, it seemed like you, you're worried about everything being part of the same thing. Um, sorry, you phrased well, but it I think epistemology, I, I think I'm worried about epistemology, how we think about this stuff and how we think about those connections, right? Um, to be able, I mean, I think as an historian of religion, that's what I think I've been trained to try to do that my whole career. But, and I've, and I'm having a hard time and I really appreciate the la the, the sort of anxiety that, I think perhaps we all feel that we just don't quite have the tools and the resources to sort of move forward sometimes. I think you're right, John, that the idea of distributed agency is the is it, it's not an accident that it comes to the fore now for a bunch of people in in the in the technological milieu. It's not like it's technologically deterministic or anything. It's just it's just an atmospherics that shapes the technology. And yeah, back and forth. Yeah, I don't think that's an accident. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I don't see that there are uh, any more questions. Um, and it's seven o'clock, kind of about time to wrap up. So um, thank you. Um, all of you, this was wonderful, uh, wonderful conversation, um, inspirational, in fact. And thank you all the people who um, attended. Um, we had 60 participants, so uh, lots of people interested in Thoreau. That gives me faith in Thoreau. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Branka, and, and thank you all for, um, for, for that incredibly stimulating panel. Um, for those of you still with us, we put the, um, the, the upcoming events for IRCPL in the chat. 
Uh, we have one more in this series on um, religion and climate on a, on a very different person, um, Glenn Beck. <laughs> um, so uh, very um, different kind of event with um, Robin Veldman, uh, a, a very uh, interesting scholar on um, religion and climate who's focused a lot on uh, Christianity here in, in the United States. So please do feel free to join us for that. And, and thanks again to all the panelists here this evening. We really appreciate your, your coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.